Good evening and Bona Yesu Asifiwa. This being the second day of the Youth Harvest Conference. This is a conference with change, with dominion, and with impact. And I'm sure the Lord is in this place, even as we learn on focusing on Jesus. Today is a beautiful day. Pastor Shad is ready for us. Remember to share this link with your WhatsApp group, with your Facebook pages, and even with job now. Share with them. Remember there is a number on your screen. If you want to talk to any of our pastors about anything, we will be ready to hear from you. Without any further ado, let me welcome the praise and worship team. Jesus is mine.
our shelter, our home, our shield of steel, our hiding place, our great defense, our high crag, the one that we have found home in, his name is Jesus. Worship his beautiful name, he's holy, he's worthy, no one is like him. He's clothed in splendor and majesty, no one is like him. We worship him in the beauty of holiness. Splendor of His Majesty, we worship Him. We join up with the angels and the twenty-four elders in crying, "Holy, holy, holy, are You, Lord God Almighty? The earth is full of Your glory. The heavens are telling of how great You are." Lord, we stand in this place to respond, O God, to Your goodness, to Your wonder, to Your matchless power, O God. You're so, so beautiful to behold. We fix our eyes on you, precious, precious, precious Lord. Would you just lift up your voice and love him for just a few minutes? I will ask you, what would it sound like if you did not have to ask for a thing? What would it sound like if you did not ask for anything? If in your prayer you did not ask for anything, what would it sound like? If your prayer was just filled with thanksgiving and worship, if you just called him by the revealed name that you have, one more time lift up a beautiful song just love on him love on him love on him has he been good let him know that he's been good to you has he gotten you out of a tough space let him know has he gotten you out of a tight situation let him know are you in a tight spot right now and he's still preserving you giving you strength to push on let him know that he's your strength have you been in a terrible, horrible pit and he has plucked you out? Let him know that, Lord, you're my shame taker. You're my crown giver. You're beautiful beyond description. You're too wonderful for words. There are no words in any human language. There are no words that can describe your splendor and your beauty. No words, Lord. But in a frail attempt, Lord, we can make up songs. Oh, and we ask that you would accept them. But Lord, deep within our hearts, when we cannot express ourselves, Lord, won't you find it in us that, Lord, we think you are beautiful beyond description. And Lord, how we love you. Yet we ask that you would teach our hearts to love you more and more and more and more. Teach our eyes to just long for the sight of you our sightly master, our soon coming king. We are your bride and you are our bridegroom. You're the soon coming king, you're the alpha and omega. You're the Lord of everything. You're wonderful and glorious. You're holy and righteous. You're victorious, you're triumphant. You're mighty and holy. You're the healer, the deliverer. You're our shield and defense. You're the strong tower. You're our best friend. Lord, we love you. We desire to be where you are forever. We desire to spend eternity singing songs about your greatness. We desire, Lord, to 
make it, dear God, to the very end because the crown of life is goals for us. But Lord, before then, we want to start right here, right now. Oh, I'm gonna say one thing I desire. 
looked at your face on the night that you saved me, God, and everything changed with just the one look at your face as you died for me on Calvary. My life was transformed. My family was transformed. Got your beautiful bed. Oh, we just want more. I don't have my car yet, but shit. Yeah, I don't got a boat. Lord, your command to me is to look and live, and so I'm grateful that we just want love. was enough to change my life to think that one look was enough to transform one look at your face on Calvary was enough to break every chain oh how beautiful then it must be for me to learn to keep my eyes on you to keep my eyes on you to keep my eyes on you Lord I wanna fix my eyes on you, Lord. Every day and every hour, I wanna keep my eyes on you. 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 God, I wanna keep my eyes on you. I wanna keep my eyes on you. I wanna keep my eyes on you. I wanna behold the beauty of your holiness. For every day that I am alive, yes, we trust. Everything changes. Everything changes. God, I'm captivated. I'm captivated. I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. We just wanna look. from the things of this world. We want to fix our eyes on you. We want to turn our eyes on you.
to turn my eyes upon Jesus. I want to look in His wonderful face. Thank you very much for the invite. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Shadrach Mwindi Mbithi. I'm born again. Christ is Lord and Savior in my life. I fellowship and serve with Deliverance Church Kaha Sukari. And uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, we will go straight to the word of God. Our reading comes from the book of Philippians chapter 3. Uh, from verse 12 all the way to ch chapter 4, verse 1. Um, before I read the word of God, I'd just like to do a small introduction of the book of Philippians so that we can get to understand where Paul is coming from when he is telling us and encouraging us to focus and to press on to the goal. So the book of Philippians is written by Paul. Paul writes this, uh, and it is dedicated to a church, a church that meets in Lydia's house. Uh, the book of Acts 16 quite explains the story of how Paul gets to Philippi and meets with this lady. Uh, Lydia preaches the gospel to her, and Lydia gives her life to Jesus. And um, later, after she has believed, the entire household also believes and from there, uh, so the church is formed. And this is quite a different kind of book because unlike any other books that Paul has written, in this book Paul is not uh, correcting anything really, but he's just encouraging a church to love the Lord and to be joyous even in trials and, and, and in suffering and temptations and also to live in unity. So the theme of this book is really joy and fellowship. And so we will read the word of God, and then we'll pray, and we will get to hear what the Lord has in store for us. Let's read the word of God. Philippians 3, 12, 4 to 1. This is what the Bible says. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it. Um, sorry. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead of me, I press on towards the goal of the price and of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Let us hold true to what we have attained. Verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the examples you have seen us. Um, verse 18, for many of whom I have often told you, 
and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is, it, is their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we attain, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you because your word um, is alive and active. We thank you for your word is true. We thank you for your word uh, makes wise the simple. It gives joy to the heart. We thank you for by your word are your servants warned and kept from great transgression. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be glorifying to you, O Lord, my God and my Redeemer. Amen. Uh, our topic today is first things first. As we focus, as we press on towards a goal, I think we need to put things right. We need to have our priorities right. And the Bible encourages us in the text that we've read to do that, to press on and to have our focus clear. To help us understand this topic much better, we will answer three questions. Number one, what is this goal? Number two, we will answer the question, why should we focus on this goal? And then the third question that we will answer is, how are we going to do that? And so we start the first with the first question, what is this goal? And the Bible says in the book of Colossians, that this is the goal, friends. The goal is Jesus Christ. He says this. He says, not that I have already obtained this. Not that I am perfect. But I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Verse 13 says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead of me, I press on. Paul is encouraging the Philippian brethren to press on towards something. When you read the verses that are just before the text that we've read, Paul is telling this Philippian church that he had everything. He, he uh, lays bear an array of things that he was. He says he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says he's circumcised on the eighth day. And he says that he's a Pharise, Pharisee and a zealot in passion. But then he calls all these, these things rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing the Lord. And one of the things that he wants to attain is a righteousness that is not of himself, but a righteousness that comes from Christ. And so the goal, the goal that Paul is encouraging the Philippian church to pursue and the focus that we should all be pursuing is this, a righteousness not of our own self, but a righteousness that is of God. A righteousness that is not because of the things that we do because our works cannot save us. Our works cannot give us the righteousness that we so desire. But Jesus Christ imputes righteousness on us and so then the righteousness, which is the goal that Paul is talking about, the righteousness that we should pursue is a righteousness from God. And then how do we pursue this righteousness from God? We pursue a righteousness from God by understanding that everything we try and do, everything we try and do by our own strength is futile and cannot accord to us the righteousness that Paul talks about in this letter. 
Paul says that he does not consider that he, he is perfect because he is not. Because the process of sanctification is really a journey. That when you gave your life to Jesus, something happened to you. You were saved. And every day as you live as a Christian, you are being saved. And you will be eventually and finally saved when you are glorified and your body is transformed to be like that of Christ. And so Paul urges these people to focus. And what is the goal that Paul is urging these people to focus on? The goal is number one, Christ and his righteousness. Because when you are righteous, when you pursue holiness, the Bible says you will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see the Lord. Beloved, when we pursue holiness, when we hit the standard and the things of this world, when we let go of everything that the world, the world has to offer and follow Jesus Christ with everything we have, we attain a righteousness, a righteousness that is not of our own, but a righteousness that is imputed to us by Jesus Christ. To answer the second question, why should we focus <clears throat> or why should we press on to this goal? First thing is because Christ has already done it for us. Beloved, our race becomes simpler and easier because the victory is already won. Christ has done it for us. We are no longer enemies of God. We are no longer enemies of God. Christ has done it for us. And so when he, he already accomplishes it, then what is, is remaining of us is to listen, is to trust and obey and follow him. And so when Paul is telling the Philippian church to pursue the Lord and to press on towards this call, he knows that it is already done. Friends, I want to encourage us that that which the Lord demands of us, he has already started it. And the Bible says that he who started a good work in us is faithful to bring it to an end. The Bible says in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in us both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Friends, we fight a fight that is already won. All we do is to show up in the ring and get the belt because Christ won it for us. And so when we are running, we are not running like people who are running aimlessly. We run because we know that our hope is secure. We know that our God has secured this for us. Second reason why we need to press on towards this goal, it is because it is the Christian responsibility. The Bible re reminds us in the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 that work out your salvation in fear and trembling for it is Christ. It is God who works in us. So look at this. There is double responsibility for the believer. God has his part to play, but the Christian also has a part to, pray, to play. It reminds us to, to, to work out our salvation, to shed off the heavy weight that we so carry, to hate sin and pursue the Lord. Friend, it is a Christian responsibility to pursue godliness. It is sad when we are living in a world that is full of perversion, sexual immorality, and all the kind of things that are happening. But then the Lord demands of us to pursue holiness. It is a responsibility of the Christian to pursue holiness. Friends, when we are told to press on towards the higher mark, we are not to, told to press on towards a, a higher lifestyle or a change of anything. We are told to 
sacrifice our, our desires and the desires of the flesh for the desires of God. That the passion and the purpose of God will be your passion, believer. Look at what the Bible says in verse 15. It says that you may be blameless of chapter 2. It says that, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation among whom you shine as lights to the world. Beloved, we are called to shine like light. We are called to shine in darkness. That's why the Bible in the book of Matthew says that we are the light of the world. Friends, when our view of the eternity, when our view of that which the Lord has promised for us is little, and we only quit Christian living to becoming better or richer, we live a lie. We live in such a way that our lives are full of darkness. Because the Bible actually says that you can have darkness in your eyes. What does this mean? It means that your view, that your perspective about life is narrow. So that then if you have an eternal perspective, if the prayer of your heart is that the Lord will paint and stamp your eyeballs with the picture of eternity, that everything you do, you do it for that purpose, then your life will be focused on the things that our God and Master is focused on. Beloved, the Lord hates sin and he calls us to pursue holiness. It is a Christian responsibility to pursue holiness. And how do we do this? How do we do this? Number one, Paul reminds the Philippian church to focus on God. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, stand firm thus in the Lord. Focus on God. Believers, you cannot do anything good by your own. Oh, our hearts are so prone to wonder. I feel it. Every moment of my life, I feel it. I am prone to wonder. And the only thing that sticks me to the gospel, the only thing that sticks me to this Christian walk is a focus on God. It is a sustenance of the Holy Spirit of God. Believe us, there are cry for each and every one of us should be, Lord, may my eyes stick, stick, stick to you. Lord, may you wrap me tightly with your embrace that I will not run away from it. Friends, for it is so easy for us to forget, for so easy for us to forget the party that is happening, the party that we are promised about and start fighting for the crumbs of the bread that fall from the table where the party is happening. And most of the times, believer, when you sin, most of the time, believer, when you are tempted and you stray away from the gospel, listen to this, most of the time when you sin and are tempted away from that which the Lord has called to be truth, there is a lie in your heart that there is better satisfaction than in the embrace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to suggest to us, strongly in fact, that there is no better place to be at than in our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Focus on God. Friends, the, the, the only way we will get to the end, the only way we will struggle and get to the end is if our focus is on God. The Bible says, trust not on your own understanding. Lead not on your strength. Focus on God. Reason number two, how we are able to press on, is if we imitate others. Paul says in verse 17, that brothers join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have seen in us. Paul introdu introduces such a critical thing in the Christian life. He introduces accountability. He said that the only way we will get to the end is if we are accountable to each other. And in this sense, he's saying that there has to be someone who has deeper understanding of the gospel, deeper understanding of the, these things that 
God reveals to us through the Bible so that you can walk in the way that he sets before you. Oh, I pray that you will find people who will call you out when you are in sin. Paul introduces a very deep principle for the Christian accountability. Another thing that Paul introduces is discipleship. Paul actually says that the Christian walk, the only way the Christian will make it and will be successful is if, number one, he's under discipleship. And how is discipleship? What is discipleship? Discipleship is walking and following your master's footsteps. And discipleship happens twice, in two ways. I'm sorry. It happens in two ways. It happens, number one, by teaching. We teach the word of God, and from it you are discipled. The Bible says in the book of Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, it says, teach them to obey all the things that I have taught you. So teaching creates disciples. Another thing that creates disciples, and Paul mentions it when he says imitate, it's that discipleship is caught. Discipleship is not only taught, but it is caught so that you can walk with people who are walking in ways that glorify and honor the Lord, and you learn from them and grow in your faith. So Paul says, man, walk with people that Walk with people that have the same perspective, the same uh, mind, and the same purpose as we do. And then Paul does a very, very uh, critical thing here. He does a comparison that is amazing. Look at from verse 19. He says, these guys who do not, who are the enemies of the cross, these people who are not believers, this is what they do. Their end is destruction. He says that their God is their belly. They live to satisfy themselves. And their glory is their shame. They take pride in sin. They take pride in futile things. He says that their mind is on earthly things. He says that these guys, all they do is store up wealth for themselves in funny, crooked ways. Their mind is on earthly things. They want to do the best things. They want to conquer the world. They have no eternal perspective in their, in their hearts. But then look at what he compares them with. He says, but we are citizens in heaven. Beloved, that if you are a believer, you are not a citizen on earth. You just are passing by. You are a pilgrim in this land. It is funny how pilgrims are making this land their home. They are storing up everything in this land. Beloved, look at how our perspective, look at how our focus has been messed with by the things of this world. We have created homes for ourselves. Not to say that homes are bad, but what is, your, what is your eternal perspective? Is it joined? Is it hooked to this place? I once asked a friend a certain question and they've never answered me. What happens when your God dies? What happens when that thing that you've built your life around, that thing that you've built your hope on, crumbles and falls down? Beloved, the answer is simple. You will crumble and die with it. But when you have it, an eternal perspective, when you know that you're a citizen in heaven, all your life, the life you live, will be with that in heart, with that in mind. The gospel will be the reason why you live. You will look at things with a gospel perspective, knowing that this is not our home. Paul says that, um, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior. Oh, beloved, we await a savior. This is hope for us, friends. This is hope that we are awaiting a savior, one who will come to conquer death and finish it completely. One who will finish the devil 
completely, seen completely, all these things will be defeated. And that's what I am waiting for. Man, that's my focus. That gives me hope to keep waiting and waiting. That gives me hope to keep pursuing and pursuing because we await a savior. A savior who's going to take us away from this turmoil and, and struggle. A savior who's going to save us from ourselves. A savior who's going to save us from death forever. Oh, how I wish that you are with me in this wait. He's our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will transform our lowly bodies. Friends, unlike the unbeliever who takes pride who takes pride in his shame and who lives for the belly, we are going to be transformed. And we are going to be like him. Oh, how pleasant and glorious it is that we live for such a hope. And that we are going to be transformed. The Bible says we will be like his Glorious body. Ah, and how is he going to do this? He's going to do this by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Oh, this is such an encouraging thing to the believer, but it is such a threat to the non-believer. That yes, we are going to be transformed, but oh my God, to the non-believer... The Bible says all knees will bow. All tongues will confess that Jesus Christ is king. Friend, you, you'd better confess right now than later when it is mandatory. You'd rather confess right now that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, when he comes with persuasion, than when he comes with power, because then your end is destruction. And then Paul finishes with an encouragement and says, therefore, my brothers, who, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I conclude, I have a charge to the believer. Believer, pursue the righteousness of God. Love the Lord with everything you have. Love him. Love him. For friends, that's the goal that we will get to eternity with him. Believer, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Believer, focus. Focus on Christ and our heavenly home, for that is the call. And number three, for the believer, heaven and not this world is our home, so live like it. I have a warning to the non-believer. Destruction awaits you. Oh, sleeper, if all that you live for is for yourself, if all that you live for is for your glory, destruction awaits you. But the story does not end there. There is hope for the non-believer. That if you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is God. Then you will be saved. And when you do that, there is a new focus, a new hope, a new goal for us. Because all these things we do in our lives without Jesus Christ are futile. They have no, no eternity in perspective. A friend of mine once told me something that God has nothing to do with anything that has no eternal value. And I think that changed my theology about life. It changed my perspective about everything. 
I realized that I was living a life that had no eternal perspective. My goal was narrow. But when the Lord came into my heart, when I believed him and I confessed him with my mouth, my perspective of life changed. And every day, it's my prayer that I will be found faithful, loving him, serving him, and pursuing his glory. For that is the sole purpose of man. Believer, the goal we are pressing on towards is Jesus and our heavenly citizenship. Thank you very much for listening. I'd like us to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the sharing of your word. Lord, your word promises us that there is never a time your word comes and does not fulfill that which it comes to do. So may you accomplish that which you want to accomplish in the lives of everyone watching and listening. Lord, I pray for them that are listening and watching and following us that are not believers. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict them to the realization that you are God. And that Heavenly Father, you will, by your grace, capture them. And may the, the Holy Spirit convict them to the point of saying you are God and Savior. I give you all the glory. I give you all the honor. Thank you for using me. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and we believe. Amen. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you again. Thank you so much, Pastor Shad, for that powerful, powerful word. And I pray that you have been blessed even as I have been blessed in this place. And it's now time to give. Ooh, I hope that you are ready to give. We are going to watch a clip even as it tells us more about how we are going to give the Lord and bless the Lord with our offerings. Bwana Asifiwe, we invite you to give your tithes and offerings online via the M-Pesa pay bill 247247 under the account number 012012 or under the pay bill 864231 under the account number stating the purpose of your gift. You can also send a direct bank transfer to Equity Bank under the account 11802610647000 or you can send it to Cooperative Bank under the account 0112808167. Or to Standard Chartered Bank under the account 01028765320. Let's pray for the giving. Our Father and our God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we worship you and we give you all the praise. Thank you for everything that you have given us. Thank you, Jehovah, King of Glory, even because we, even, even as we give, we believe that you have, you have told us to bring our, our, our things into the storehouse of the Lord, and you are going to release the heavens, Jehovah God. Therefore, I pray for every giver that the Lord, you are going to refresh them, you are going to increase them, Jehovah God. And even for those who do not have, they are asking you for something that you may give them, Jehovah, that you may remember mercy upon their lives. Thank you because you continually walk with us even throughout this conference even tomorrow as we go in day three that the Lord you are going to walk with us you are going to strengthen us and you are going to give us hope even as we continue to focus on you for this I pray believing and trusting in Jesus name amen Thank you for watching today's service, and I believe that you are blessed. Remember to tune in the same time, same place tomorrow, and the Lord is also in this place, and he will speak to us even as we continue on this week. Until tomorrow, have a blessed night. Bye-bye.